The next speaker is uh, Natalie uh, Gallant, or is it Gallant? Gallant. Uh, who's going to talk about targeted monoclonal antibody therapies to detect and reverse cardiac amyloidosis. Thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Natalie Gallant. I'm from the Chakrabarty Lab. And today I will be talking to you about some of the work that we've been doing at University of Toronto and UHN on developing therapeutic monoclonal antibodies to detect and halt TTR-related cardiac amyloidosis. I'll first start with a little bit about the protein that causes this disease and then eventually get into the disease itself and finally some of the research work we've done on developing immunotherapeutic strategies. I don't know how you change it. Oh. oh, the green button, sorry. So the main culprit of this disease is a protein called transthyretin, TTR. TTR is a serum transport protein. It's involved in transporting thyroid hormones T3 and T4 throughout the body, as well as vitamin A via retinal binding protein. It's primarily synthesized in the liver, and it's a 55 kilodalton homotetraper, meaning that it's composed of four identical subunits, as indicated in the space-filled molecular diagram. It has a high serum concentration of 0.1 to 0.4 mix per mil, and unfortunately this protein can misfold and deposit as amyloid plaques throughout the body, including the heart. TTR amyloidosis can be divided into two different types, the first being wild-type TTR amyloidosis or wild-type ATTR. Um, this disease is characterized by the deposition of wild-type TTR amyloid throughout the body. The signs and symptoms of the disease, though, are nonspecific and are often misinterpreted, and they include cardiac amyloidosis, which manifests as a slow restrictive cardiomyopathy, retinopathy, polyneuropathy, and bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. The second one is hereditary TTR amyloidosis, which is characterized by the deposition of mutant TTR amyloid throughout the body. This disease can be further characterized into three subclasses, including familial amyloidic polyneuropathy, familial amyloidic cardiomyopathy, and familial leptomeningeal amyloidosis. The number of mutations that have been identified in patients worldwide span the entire protein. So therefore, the mutations that appear in these diseases are not localized to one section of the protein at all. So what treatment options do patients have at this point? Unfortunately, not many. Um, for those who are eligible to go under tr surgery, they can go through liver or heart transplant. In terms of pharmacotherapies or drugs, um, many have been tried and tested, as indicated on the slide. However, none have been approved by the FDA nor Health Canada. There is one drug, it's called Tafamidis. It has been approved in both the EU and Japan, but um, it reached stage three clinical trials um, in the US, and the FDA looked at the data and they didn't approve it, but as of 2016, they have not fully rejected it yet. But as it stands still, the only options that are available are transplants. So how does transthyretin even form amyloid in the first place? Well, what happens is, is that TTR in its native tetrameric form stays in its tetramer, but this can dissociate into monomers. These monomers can go under aberrant changes and become amyloidogenetic monomers, which can then become aggregates and eventually form amyloid fibrils. Here at the Chakrabarty Lab, we have developed a method or an immunotherapeutic strategy in which we hope to use antibodies to specifically target these misfolding intermediates while neglecting and leaving the tetramer, native tetramer alone. This work has resulted in our first publication, which appeared in scientific reports, in which we developed a polyclonal antibody, which was able to specifically target these misfolding intermediates by targeting an epitope, which was deeply buried within the TTR tetramer, but exposed upon monomerization, as indicated with red. The main feature of this publication was the fact that these polyclonal antibodies were able to inhibit fibro formation, amyloid fibro formation. In comparison to a commercialized pan-specific TTR um, polyclonal control, our MIS-TTR, misfolded TTR polyclonal antibody, exhibited substoichiometric inhibition of amyloid fibril um, formation at an IC50 at 9 nanomolar. We then wanted to validate whether this polyclonal antibody was specifically targeting this mis these misfolding intermediates. So we did that using two types of Western blots. The first being a native page Western blot, which put the protein in non-denaturing conditions. The second being an SDS page denaturing Western blot, which denatured the protein into its misfolding intermediates. Our 
antibody did not recognize the TTR tetramer in its native form, but it did recognize it in the monomeric form, in the misfolding intermediates. However, in comparison to the co um, commercialized control, we showed that that antibody was able to recognize both forms of the protein. We then ventured further with this project and collaborated with a pharma company in South San Francisco called Prothena Biosciences, and that led to our development of monoclonal antibodies. And so the difference between monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies is that monoclonal antibodies can be used as therapeutics or drugs, whereas polyclo polyclonals cannot. So in that publication, we showed that we developed multiple monoclonal antibodies, which were targeted toward that same epitope, which was buried in the TTR tetramer, but exposed upon a monomerization. And these monoclonal antibodies, once again, were able to show fibril inhibition, um, where in comparison to our isotype controls, which showed no fibril inhibition abilities um, at all. We then wanted to validate and see whether these monoclonal antibodies could actually recognize TTR amyloid um, in vivo using, so what we did was we obtained cardiac tissue from a patient who had a hereditary ATTR, more specifically the I84S mutation, and what we did was uh, we exposed our monoclonal antibody to tissue, tissue sections from that patient's cardiac tissue, and we saw that the monoclonal antibody was able to specifically label TTR amyloid in comparison to a commercial control, which labeled all forms of the transthyretin protein, and our isotype control, which had no labeling whatsoever. We compared this staining, or this labeling, with two types of controls, which generically um, mark amyloid. The first being thioflavin T, and the second being Congo red. And comparing these uh, stains with our 14G8 monoclonal antibody, we saw nice co-localization, indicating that our monoclonal antibodies were actually able to target uh, and label um, TTR amyloid in cardiac tissue. After that, we wanted to see whether our antibodies can induce an immune response. So what we did was, we did a THP1 cell assay, which uses monocytes. And what we did was, we labeled our unfolded transthyretin protein with a fluorescent marker. Upon, upon exposure of that transthyretin protein with the monoclonals, we saw monocytic cellular uptake of that protein in comparison to the isotype control, where we saw no uptake whatsoever. This has led us to our current state in our research in which we're using uh, immunogold transmission electron microscopy to visualize and see where our monoclonal antibodies are binding along the TTR amyloid in their fibers. And so what we found from our study so far is that our monoclonals are preferentially targeting the TTR fibril ends acting as fibril cappers as well as to the oligomer aggregates. So this image on the screen above is an electron microscope image of TTR amyloid fibers. And so what, and these fibers have been exposed to our monoclonal antibody. The monoclonal antibody has been labeled with a secondary amino gold, and that is indicated with the black spheres, as you can see. I can't, no, with black solid spheres. So what we can see from this is that our monoclonal antibodies are preferentially binding to the fibril ends of TTR, and as well as oligomer aggregates within our samples. However, please notice that they also don't bind along the length of the fiber or the stem. We have seen hundreds of examples of our monoclonal antibodies binding to these oligomer aggregates, and these are just magnified images of those oligomer aggregates. We have seen these in wild-type TTR amyloid samples, V122I TTR mutant amyloid samples, as well as V30M TTR mutant samples, and V30M is the most common mutation found in patients worldwide with these diseases. And once again, this is another image showing um, our monoclonal antibody labeled with immunogold secondary binding to specifically the fibril ends uh, rather than the actual along the length of the fiber. And this is a closer up image, a magnified. A colleague in my lab, Dr. Poonam Ghosh, also examined and investigated this fibril immune binding complex uh, using isothermal titration, um, so isothermal titration calorimetry, or ITC, analysis. And what she found was, for both wild-type TTR amyloid fibrils and V122I TTR, and V122I TTR is a mutation most commonly found in African-American populations, that the monoclonal antibodies had two classes of binding sites. 
So at this point, we believe that our antibodies are acting at the later half of this amylogenous pathway. So in summary, we have now developed some antibodies which are able to in, uh, bind to these oligomer aggregates and the fibril ends. And this binding has been shown to both arrest and prevent fibril growth. Um, these resulting immunocomplexes using our THP1 uh, monocyte assays were able to be phagocytized or opsonized by our monocytes, so therefore inducing an immune response, and as well as we have shown that they're actually able to bind to specifically TTR amyloid in cardiac tissue. So therefore, our results as they stand, hopefully these monoclonal antibodies will have usage in both diagnostics as well as therapeutics or treatment for patients who do have TTR-related cardiac amyloidosis. I would like to thank the following uh, individuals on this slide for their consistent support during my PhD research, as well as my supervisor, Dr. Avi Chakrabarty, for his consistent support, as well as the following uh, sponsors of my work, and especially the Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research. I thank you for your continuous support. Thank you, everybody. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Natalie. This is, uh, this is also open. Uh, for discussion, I, I have a it's, it's, it's a bit of an unfair question, so I'll, I'll preface it. But I'm kind of hoping that if you can really bind and uh, see phagocytosis and removal of amyloid, uh, have you looked at uh, this in the brain? Because I'm kind of hoping you're going to cure dementia. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, there are a lot of dementia. There's a, there's a great deal of dementia that's actually caused by uh, amyloidosis. So have you looked at any other, let me make it a fairer question, have you looked at any other tissues other than cardiac cells? Uh, the, the amyloid that is in the brain is a different type of um, amyloid. Unfortunately, that would be great to cure both. <laughs> um, so no, we've just looked at cardiac tissue as of now. Mansoor. Um, Natalie, congratulations, really nice. Um, so uh, can you tell us how common TTR amyloidosis is? And, um, and then secondly, you developed a, a monoclonal and uh, you've got nice in vitro demonstration that you've got biological activity. So what are the steps that this gets approved for the treatment of these individuals that have this? So the commonality of TTR amyloidosis and um, related cardiomyopathy is related to the subpopulations. So in terms of worldwide, TTR amyloidosis affects different groups or patient populations more than others, especially in Portugal, um, Sweden, Japan, and African-American populations. Um, with, in Portugal right now, it's, it, actually, it is a huge problem, and so that's where there's a lot of research um, going on in that part of the world. Um, in terms of the different mutants, they affect different people, uh, different populations differently. For example, the V122i is found in 3.2% of African-Americans. Um, worldwide. Uh, the V30M is the most common mutant um, in terms of it surpasses even the V122i. Uh, and in terms of the wild type TTR amyloidosis, um, there are stats that say 80% of both men and women can develop it, but they found that 80% of men over 60 years old have signs of developing TTR cardiac amyloidosis. But there's no way to diagnose them right. other than fat biopsies, and sometimes it's already too late. Right. So I thought you were going to answer by saying it's an unfair question because the diagnosis is really challenging, right? So yeah. now you might have the ability to increase the, the diagnostic rate of people with potentially heart failure that may have unrecognized TTR-related amyloidosis. Okay. What about the steps to okay, either make a diagnostic test to become approved or a therapeutic? Where, where are you with that? So right now, therapeutics is where the project is going so far and as well as we are working on um I'm looking for some heart tissue <laughs> um, in terms of diagnostics. We have the tools. Um, we just don't have, um, we have the tools and we're ready to, in terms of diagnostics. Um, we just haven't been able to develop any as of yet. And in terms of therapeutics, there are, they're testing them in mice and they're using amyloidoma mouse models. So they're on the way. Dinesh? 
Nice work again. Uh, just following up on Munzer's question, have you been able to get this antibodies to attach onto contrast agents, whether it's MRI-based contrast agents or echo-based contrast agents, again, to try, try to help with the diagnostic um, issue? Because we, we struggle with that with imaging to differentiate the kinds of amyloidosis. Not as of yet. Not as of yet. But that's a fantastic route to go. That's a conversation. Yes. <laughs>